hush falls over the crowd. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much again for coming. I mean it when I say I love a live audience. <laughs> it just makes it more dynamic. Um, for those who might be are here for the first time, I'm going to be repetitive and tell you who I am. Uh, my name is Christine Edmonds, and I work here in the office here at St. Wenceslas, helping to coordinate adult faith formation opportunities, of which this is one. And I um, want to tell you a story. It has nothing to do with tonight's talk. But I was, I was looking at the big, beautiful stained glass window of St. John Nepomucene. You know, he's got his finger like this, right? So this morning I was walking over to the school and the littlest knights were walking towards here to see the fire trucks and stuff. And I saw one little girl and she was picking her nose. I thought, oh, well, that's what happens with little ones. I saw another one, two people later, picking her nose. I'm like, they must really be sick. And then I saw a third one picking his nose. I'm like, what's going on? And then I realized this is how they walk. <laughs> they were trained to walk, to be silent when they walk. So they all put their fingers to lips, but some of them just looked like <laughs> <laughs> So I learned <laughs> that St. John's not the only one who practices, practices silence. Oh, so um, tonight is the third in our series, um, beautiful series of praying the mass. And Father Taylor Leffler, who's been our associate for four years, has been um, sharing us with us his wisdom and so again tonight is our final of this series and i will announce that olivier who's my technology um, angel he's going to try to get these up on our website so if we figure out how to do that there'll be a link so if you can't find them on facebook or, or your friends aren't on facebook and you want to share them we'll figure out how to make that possible so stay tuned and join me in welcoming back father taylor leffler Uh, I want to just thank Christine. I said at the beginning, I, we're such a good team. Uh, I love to speak and I love uh, to come up with things. And Christine is so good at like, I don't know, putting up the signs and putting it in the bulletin and putting it on the website. So have a little round of applause for Christine for her faithful work. I get to be Mary and she gets to be Martha, which is <clears throat> helpful. Let's pray. <clears throat> if you guys think we should start a St. Wenceslas podcast, tell me. Like if we were to take all of the content that we do via like Facebook live stream and just cut the audio and make it a podcast episode, wouldn't that be kind of cool? <laughs> all right. That's on tape. You're all applauding. There is some fear that maybe you don't have the the manpower to, or the woman powers, perhaps, to make that happen. Uh, who knows? We don't have a communication director or an IT person. Olivier pretty much does that for us. So we'll see. We'll see what we can do. Let's pray from John 6. Good old John 6. If you've never read through John chapter 6, it's a very powerful chapter of the gospel. <clears throat> and I was always a little bit confused because I was like, wait, Jesus doesn't institute the Eucharist until like John... 17 or eight, like the third year of his ministry, what's he doing in chapter six talking about the Eucharist? It seems a little weak. It wasn't the Last Supper. John six is in a synagogue in Capernaum. What's he doing? It was almost exactly a year before that Passover where he was going to institute the Eucharist. So he was, he was like getting them ready this Passover for what was going to happen next Passover when it was all going to happen. Anyway, this is some of what Jesus has to say about the Mass, about the gift of the Eucharist in John chapter 6. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, 
so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. Jesus, we thank you for always generously giving up your body and pouring out your blood so that we might experience eternal life even now. Open our eyes and our hearts to the mystery of this sacrifice that you have instituted and given to your church to be offered to your Father and ours. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> uh, night number one, if you weren't here, little Holy Thursday number one, we talked about the liturgy of the word and how powerful it is to just feast on the word that's given to us at each mass. And I encouraged everyone <clears throat> to read through the readings before a mass to perhaps come 10 minutes early or so and just read through the readings and kind of see what captures your attention or moves your heart, amongst other things. Uh, last Thursday, we talked about the offertory and the Eucharistic prayer, and I hope that I helped some of you to experience that in a much more prayerful way. We don't have to stop praying during the offertory, even though sometimes it feels that way, like it's a show or a parade or, oh, finally I just get to sit, you know. But it's, it's still a time to pray, to um, get to understand in our own hearts what it is that we're offering to the Lord along with the gifts of bread and wine. And then, of course, the Eucharistic prayer. There's so much that's being said in that Eucharistic prayer as, of course, we experience the consecration, but it's more than just the consecration. There's so much more that we're praying in the midst of that. And then we left off, of course, with the great amen, which is your amen to the, oh, I don't know, five and a half minutes that the priest has just been praying himself. Hopefully you've been praying with him, but that's your chance to say, yes, I believe, so be it. I, I commune myself with everything you just said in the great amen. And I love when they do it up a little bit. Today at the Blue Mass with the firefighters and the police officers, the amen was just like strong. We had the, the choir from Creighton Prep and they just, oh, it was beautiful the way that they sang that great amen. Tonight, I want to close things out talking about praying the Mass with the rite of communion, of course, a very important part of the Mass. It's the great crescendo of the rest of the Mass. Just a little bit about the dismissal and the blessing. And then I want to close by giving you a little expose of what happens with these vestments, what they are, how I put them on, what they mean, but especially what the prayers are that go along with each vestment as we're putting them on before Mass, so that even you can sort of get something or be moved by what you see in the vestments at each Mass that perhaps you've taken for granted for a long time. All right, to be super honest, after all the, the Eucharistic prayer, the offertory, the bread, the wine, the sacrificial language, the lifting up, the, the consecration, and the great doxology, and the uh, I'll praise and, you know, everything, and you say amen, it seems to me like from that moment, you should get in line and come receive communion. Am I wrong? Like, doesn't it seem like we just spent this big, long prayer, we're kneeling, the Eucharist is here, let's go receive it. But there's this strange thing that we do in the, as the newer form of the Mass, of course, since, since 1965, where it's, we say amen, and then we all stand up, and we kind of do something else. And it used to bother me a little when I was studying kind of the history of the Mass and, and just the, the Roman Missal, and I'm like, why? Why do we do all this stuff about the sacrifice and the Eucharist and the offering to the Father, and then we all like stand up and start kind of praying something else? And it dawned on me, Jesus talks about this. He says, when you bring your gift to the altar but then you realize that your brother has something against you, go, leave your gift at the altar and go and first be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. 
So literally what we're doing at every Mass, if you pay attention, there's, there's a lot of kind of, um, well, there, there's a lot of uniting your prayer with what it is that the priest is praying, the great anamnesis, the great um, petitional prayers over the whole world, all the things we're praying for at the Mass, the beauty and the symbolism and the all, just all that, the consecration, all that happens at the altar. But before we come up and receive the fruits of this sacrifice, we do what Jesus said and, and pray that we would be reconciled with each other and indeed the whole world. So what is it that we do? Well, we all stand up and we pray the Lord's Prayer together. That's a very um, unitive thing to do, praying our Father. So we're praying to the same Father. And then if you listen to the prayers of the priest before the sign of peace, the priest is specifically praying for peace and unity in accordance with your will, right? Peace and unity. Again, Jesus did this at the Last Supper. He didn't just say, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given for you. Body of Christ, body of Christ, blood of Christ. Bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, done. He instituted the Eucharist, and then he prayed for the unity of the church, the great high priestly prayer of Jesus, they call it. Father, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus prayed this at the table at the Last Supper. So we're, we're doing what Jesus did, and we're saying what Jesus said, and before we come to sort of bring our gift to the altar or receive the gift from the altar, we make sure that not only are we prepared to be in communion with him, but that we're coming to the altar in communion with one another. It's a, it's a twofold communion. We are in communion with Jesus, which is very important, but this is the piece that gets missed, I think, that we're also receiving communion with his bride, the church. You are his bride, the church, but so is everyone else around you. That's your spouse, that's your family, that's your friends, that's your worst enemy. That's the person that you hold a grudge against. That's the person who abused you. That's the person on TV that you cuss at through the screen. That's the celebrity that you can't stand. That's the people in that other Democratic Party or Republican Party or this or that thing that you, you think about and you, like, that you're ready to be reconciled with all of your brothers and sisters as you come to the altar. That's a very powerful thing. And that you're prepared as well to be in communion with the bride of Jesus, the church. This is why the big bad Catholic church doesn't just dole out communion to everybody. Because we very much believe that as you're receiving the sacrament of communion, you are saying amen to the bride of Christ, the church. I was taught as a kid that when you're saying amen at communion, you're saying amen to everything that the church believes. My very first Sunday here at St. Wenceslaus, this guy just ripped me to shreds after Mass. I'll never, I can't forget it because it's my first Sunday as a priest in a parish. And this guy, he came up and I said, the body of Christ. And he goes, ha ha. I'm like, um, I'm hold it. You're probably not Catholic. That's usually a pretty, you know, if they don't say amen or they don't hold out their hands, it's like, oh, you might not be Catholic. So he gave him a blessing. And he kind of did this at me. And he, wa he walked away, kind of had a furrowed brow. After Mass, that man, oh, he let me have it out in the courtyard. And it was so adorable because these little old ladies were like, Father, welcome. Hey, Father, hello. Welcome to St. Wes's Last. This guy was like, Rawr! and he was, he was cussing at me. It was really unfortunate. And he said, why would you deny a brother in Christ communion? And I'm like, I don't know if I want to get into this with you right now, but I'm like, because uh, we believe it's the body and blood of Jesus. Well, so do I. I'm like, interesting. So I said, how did it become the body and blood of Jesus? He had no answer. So he, he may have believed that there was something to do with the body and blood of Jesus on the altar, but he had no, there was no belief, no common belief at all about the priesthood, the sacrifice, the, the, the apostolic succession that's come through the bride of Christ, the church, all the way through the centuries, there was just a lot missing. And he felt hurt that he didn't get to do what everyone else did, which like, I understand, but 
Anyway, rant over. It was just, it was unfortunate. It was really sad. But this, this is what we believe, that when we're receiving communion, we're saying amen to everything that the Catholic Church teaches to be true again and again. We're receiving communion not just with him, but with his bride, the church, with one another. That's why we offer each other the sign of peace. That can be done, that can be done in a really prayerful way. Often we only exchange the sign of peace with those who are sitting near us, but during the Our Father, during the little prayers of the priest around that time, I'd encourage you prayerfully to kind of take inventory of who's around you. Interestingly enough, it's most often your spouse and your children, the people that you live with, who are also the people that you guys talk about in confession the most, right? <laughs> I talk about this a lot. It's like, surprise, surprise, parents sin against their kids, and kids sin against their parents, and spouses sin against each other. Like, wow, shocker, right? So if they're the ones that you mention the most in confession, they're also the ones with whom you get to offer a sign of peace. And that's not just some cute little high-five, whoop de doo thing. We're not kumbaya on in here. It's, it's really meant to be, I am offering you the peace that Jesus Christ can bring. And with that comes my own repentance for how I've mistreated you, how I failed you in my relationship as your spouse, as your parent, as your child. Like that moment is meant to be. And then if a family member near you or someone, someone near you is going through some stuff and you know about it, what a beautiful moment for you to really offer each other a sign of peace. Again, not kumbaya and not just hunky-dory, everything's fine, but I'm, I'm wishing you the peace that Jesus prayed for in his church. I'm wishing that every place in your heart where you feel agitated, afraid, anxious, heavy, burdened, labored, that in every one of those places you would experience the peace of Jesus Christ. That's what you can communicate with. Peace. Peace. To, to really mean that as you say it. Don't throw that opportunity away. It can be really powerful. Do you ever notice at Mass, well, let's just say this. Do you ever notice when uh, Protestants pray the Lord's Prayer, they add a little something in the end? For thine is the, and the, and the, forever and ever. You know where they got that? The Mass. The Catholic Mass. It's not in the Bible. I found out that some Bibles have added that little snippet. It's definitely not part of the original manuscript. It's, that would be a very disruptive thing between the Lord's Prayer and what Jesus continues saying about forgiveness. They get that from the Mass because... Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the... That's literally where that's from. So it's kind of funny that Protestants are the, one, the ones that add that to their Our Father, but they got it from the Catholic Mass. So very, very interesting. Uh, how that happens. But it's literally where that comes from. It's, it was the response to the prayer of the priest at the Mass in this moment where we're praying for peace before we come together to receive together the body and blood of Jesus from the altar. What happens next, again, and remember this, it's like before we're coming up to receive the body and blood of Jesus, we are making peace with each other and we're praying that the peace and the unity that Jesus desires in his church would, would happen right now. Um, I've been a priest the last four and a half years-ish. There's been some interesting stuff uh, in this parish and uh, in this country and throughout the world. And so I will tell you that that part of the Mass has taken on a very powerful meaning for me as I'm praying, Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. I'm like begging him every time. Lord Jesus, 
Give us the peace and the unity that you desire. Because we were, I don't know if you remember, like the election, the pandemic, the St. Wenceslas stuff, the masks and the vaccines and the, all that jazz. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you. <laughs> Look not at our sins from the faith. And graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. And that's the thing. It's not just us who want peace and unity. Jesus absolutely wants peace and unity in his church. He prayed for it at the Last Supper, the night before he died, in the, in the, in the most climactic sort of moment of his life. That's what he was praying for. Father, that they may be one as we are one. They and me and you and them and I and them. And we remember that whole part of the gospel? It's all just this. It's all about communion, not just our individual. So here's the thing, and this is super popular these days when people are like, oh yeah, Father, spiritual, not religious. I, it's me and God, Father, just me. I got a good, me and God got a good friendship. <clears throat> like, great, but that's only half of what he wants for you. Like, yes, God wants a tender, intimate, personal friendship and relationship with you. Yes, 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 that is so true. A lot of Catholics miss out on that piece. But there's so many other people who are missing out on the other piece, where they don't experience the ecclesial experience of Christianity. They don't experience that they're, they're members of a body, that they're part of a family, that they are a member of Christ's bride, the church, that it's also ecclesial, that we're not just in communion individually with him, but that we're in communion with each other. That's the church militant right here, and that's the church suffering in purgatory, and that's the church triumphant in heaven. That's why we have Mary and Joseph. Like, they're not just gone. They're, they didn't sort of graduate from Catholicism like all of our eighth graders do. They, they are still very much members of the church. They're members of the church, members of the church triumphant. Thanks be to God. That's where we hope to be. We're in communion with them too. And we, we pray that we would go into deeper communion with them and with each other. That's all before we come to receive communion with him. That's all a part of receiving communion with him is this ecclesial communion that we pray for. What happens next is, if, as if this wasn't already uh, packed full of scripture, everything that follows, I think it's just, it's stunning liturgical prayer. And again, so many people just like, don't understand the, the biblical roots of what it is that we're praying. So we just pray the Our Father, straight out of scripture, Jesus gave us that prayer together. Uh, we just uh, prayed for peace and unity as Jesus did in John chapter 17, I think it is, in the high priestly prayer at the Last Supper. We sing the Lamb of God, three very powerful words, calling him, this 33-year-old guy, a lamb, the Lamb of God. I talked about this in my first series on the Eucharist a couple years ago, how powerful it is to call him the Lamb of God, because for thousands of years, the people of God were offering to him their lambs. It was part of the Passover sacrifice. It was part of Yom Kippur. It was part of, but especially the Passover sacrifice, one male, unblemished, young lamb, right, per household. And they would, at the Passover, they smeared the blood on the doorpost. And ever since then, they commemorated that by sac Each household had one perfect, unblemished lamb. God, here's our lamb, commemorating what happened. God, forgive us our sins. Here's our sacrifice to the lamb. They bring it to the priest. The priest would kill it. The priest would butcher it. The priest would take some pieces and divvy it up, burn some of it, cook some of it, give it back to the people. They'd take it home and they'd eat it at their Seder meal. God said on this Passover, stop. I'm going to give you my lamb once and for all. Instead of us giving God our lambs, here's our lambs, here's our lambs, year after year, every household, thousands and thousands and thousands of lambs, God's like, stop, I've got one perfect lamb for you. He's going to give himself up for you, and then you'll have the capacity here at the altar to give him back to me again and again and every day if you want, to give the lamb of God back to God, the most perfect unblemished lamb the only lamb to ever come back from the dead. Every other lamb stayed dead, very dead, in fact, very, very dead. This lamb was dead, the lamb who was slain, 
but didn't stay dead. John has a vision of this lamb in the book of Revelation. He's like, I saw a lamb who appeared to have been slain, but he was standing, like living. But this lamb looked like it was killed already. That's interesting. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Whoa, we're going all the way back to Yom Kippur, where you'd have the scapegoat, literally the scapegoat. The priest would lay his hands on the head of the goat and give all the people's sins to the goat and then slap the goat and the goat would run out into the desert and die. Like That's what Yom Kippur was. That's what the Day of Atonement was, to send that lamb out into the desert to die with the sins of the people. This lamb is actually taking on all the people's sins. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, grant us peace, which we just prayed for. The priest breaks the host. It's an image of the death of Jesus, but it's also an image of the breaking of the bread, the feeding of the 5,000. And he's supposed to hold that broken host above the chalice and invite you to, I love the word, behold. Just behold the Lamb of God. So this is powerful. I always, at funerals and weddings, I always give the little communion spiel. If you're not Catholic, you can come forward and receive a blessing. A lot of people go, Ugh. They look at the person next to him and they, Ugh scowl or they're just not listening or sometimes they give me funny faces or it's very interesting weddings and funerals when there's lots of non-catholics some people get really offended some people don't so much they some people actually love the blessing i've had that before where they come up and they do this and i give them a blessing and they cry they're so moved to receive a priestly blessing mm. i i hold this up and this is a bold moment for me because i'm holding it up i just say behold the lamb of god that's bold. I don't say, behold, a little bit of bread. Behold, my shiny chalice. Like, we're not talking about bread and wine anymore. I'm, I'm holding the Lamb of God right now, and you get a moment to just behold him. What's, what does it mean to behold? Those of you who have had a child, I love watching this video, that moment that the, the baby with all the baby cheese is laid on the chest of the mother, like out the womb, right onto mom. I know it's a little bit gross. <laughs> but that mama, oh, just beholds that baby. And then like the next day, like little skin to skin stuff with mom and with dad and while they're still in the hospital, watching young parents behold their babies, oh, that gaze of just pure contemplative, receptive love. How about at weddings? Photographers know this because they're on the, they're ready to get the face of the groom when those doors open and he beholds his bride. The photographers know they're aiming at the groom and it's funny at weddings because I do a million of them. Everyone else knows too. They see the bride and like, oh, and then they go, they want to get that groom, the little cry photo, you know, and some grooms, ugly cry. Other grooms try to hold it in. Every groom reacts as he beholds his beloved bride. And the whole room beholds the bride as she comes down the aisle. That's what it means to behold. So as I'm holding him up and I say to you, behold the Lamb of God, who came up with that? John the Baptist said it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. I know you thought that I was the guy. I've been doing crazy stuff, eating locusts and wearing camel's hair and baptizing you in the river. Behold, the Lamb of God, there he is. I am not he. I'm not even worthy to untie the thong of his sandal, but that's him. That's the guy that I was talking about. I repeat the words of John the Baptist at each Mass, and I invite you to with me, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away. So I behold him. What I'm holding is him, not behold it. Behold him. That's such a powerful phrase for me. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb, straight out of the book of Revelation, as John was experiencing the heavenly banquet with the Lamb who had been slain but was no longer slain. This is the Supper of the Lamb. Scott Hahn's book is called The Supper of the Lamb. And then 
as if that wasn't scriptural enough, you say with me, so this is one of those times where priest and people say it together, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Who said that? The centurion said that when his slave was sick at home and he ran out to Jesus and said, hey, I need your help. Jesus says, where is he? And the centurion says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. And he was literally talking about his house. Like, I'm not willing, I'm not worthy to have a guy like you come into my house. I believe that if you just said the word right where we're standing right now, my servant would be healed. I love that in English, the way that it translates is, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. What do we call the top of our mouth? It's the roof of our mouth. I love that translation. I don't know if it translates the same in other languages, but we're literally, I mean, Lord, I'm not worthy. We used to say to receive you, but now we say, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Just what the centurion said, which is true. Like none of, none of us is worth, even though we've confessed our sins like a hundred times by now in this mass, I'm not, I'm not worthy to receive the body and blood of Jesus into my body. But Jesus, I love that but, only say the word and my soul shall be healed. I'm not worthy and I'll never be worthy. And yet, if you want to make me worthy, I believe that you can just by your word. I love that it's just the word, whatever the word is. Only say the word and my soul, not my servant, this time it's me, my soul shall be healed. How about a little more scripture? It's a, it's a piece that happens right before that. It's that piece I love talking about where the priest takes a little piece of the host and drops it into the chalice. It's a symbol of the resurrection of Jesus as his precious blood somehow came back into his dead body while it lay in the tomb. This resurrection of Jesus. Remember, what we receive in communion isn't the dead Jesus. We're receiving the risen, resurrected Jesus who has become himself a living sacrifice. That's an oxymoron. Sacrifices aren't living, they're dead. That's what makes it a sacrifice. When you cut that wheat down or the wine, you pluck the grapes and you've made it wine and you pour the wine out as a libation, or the animal, you gotta kill it before you sacrifice it. To be a living sacrifice is an oxymoron. But in the liturgy, I pray not only that we would be ready to receive this living sacrifice, but that each of us would truly become, I think this is from Eucharistic Prayer 4, truly become a living sacrifice to the praise of your name. Like that each of us becomes at the same time a living sacrifice. Yes, we die to ourselves, but we're constantly giving ourselves, handing ourselves over to Jesus. During that mingling, that's what that's called, the priest says quietly, May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. So now, we're bouncing all over the scriptures, but now I'm at John, right back at John 6. And I'm talking about eternal life, that this body and blood of Jesus I'm about to receive into me would bring me and to bring all of us eternal life, not, not death, not just sacrifice, but that the body and blood of Jesus would bring eternal life to me right now. It's what Jesus said like 10 times in John chapter 6. He, he kept repeating himself, live forever, live forever, never die. Your fathers, they ate the manna, but they died. You, not going to die. Eternal life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him has eternal life and I will raise him on the last day. This is what the priest prays when he mingles the body and blood of Jesus in the chalice, that this sacrifice would bring eternal life to us. Then, and I, I love this, you can Google these, but I'm going to pray these for you right now. This is, all, this is all prayer. Again, everything that I just quoted from Scripture that we say at each Mass is a beautiful prayer. We're praying for peace. We're praying for unity. I'm praying that my brother and my sister near me would experience the peace of Jesus Christ. We're praying the Our Father together. We're praying to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world to have mercy on us and grant us peace. We're praying 
to him and were saying, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. These are all stunning prayers to him. But we've shifted a little. This is kind of interesting. We've been talking to the Father for most of the Mass. At this point of the Mass, even after the Our Father, then we talk to Jesus a lot. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. That's not the Father, that's the Son. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter my roof. We're not specifically talking to the Father, we're talking to the Son, whose body and blood is before us. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace, I leave you. Now I'm talking to Jesus. I just switched from the Father to Jesus. We're directing a lot of our prayer to Jesus at this point in the Mass. And now listen to this. There's two prayers to Jesus that the priest can pray at this moment. And they're quiet prayers. So that if you ever notice that before, before I hold up the host and chalice and say, behold the Lamb of God, a lot, a lot of times the priest is like, behold the Lamb of God. And you're like, what is he doing? I'm not making stuff up. We're not, we're not praying random things. We are praying one of two prayers. Are you ready to hear what they are? Here's option one. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit through your death gave life to the world, free me by this, your most holy body and blood, from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me always faithful to your commandments and never let me be parted from you. That's the first prayer. I have them memorized. You can memorize them too, if you want. You can always pray that with the priest. Not out loud, though. That'd be weird. <laughs> Option two. It's a little bit shorter, so sometimes if I'm in a hurry, I kind of have to do this one. May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy, be for me protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. Like literally praying for healing of mind and body. That's a, that's a really powerful prayer. I pray that a lot at the 5.30 Mass when I feel like my mind is fried from a long day of ministry. May it be healing of mind and body, protection in mind and body, and a healing remedy. You can just Google, what are the secret prayers that the priest prays? And you'll find those those two prayers. I don't know that you'll find them in the Breaking Bread book, but one of you, if you get bored with my talk, you can check that out and see. Another thing that the priest prays, as people have asked me this before, once uh, we say, Lord, I'm not worthy, you should enter under my roof, we put the Eucharist back on the altar, <clears throat> I take the host, and the Roman Missal tells me to say, may the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. And then I receive him. Then, chalice, may the blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. I'm praying what Jesus said in John 6, each time I receive Holy Communion. You're not instructed to say anything when you receive communion besides amen, but if you want to pray that on your way up to communion, you go for it. I've got a few thoughts, closing thoughts here, about receiving communion before I show the vestments. <clears throat> this last Sunday, if you were at one of my masses, you heard me preach about this. I was moved by the little detail with the lepers, that when the lepers, Jesus came into this village and there was 10 lepers there, and <clears throat> it says, they stood at a distance from him and they shouted, have pity on us. He says, go show yourselves to the priests. As they were going, they were healed. One came back. And what did that one do? He fell at the feet of Jesus. So what moved me was, at the beginning, they thought they had to keep their distance. Keep their distance. They kept, they stood at a distance from Jesus. But then, once he's experienced this encounter with him, he comes so close to Jesus, and he falls at his feet. And what moved me was, in the Mass, you spend most of the time way out there in the pews, but you each get a moment to come forward into the sanctuary. So it's one of the bummers about having 87 ministers of Holy Communion 
is that it's not quite 87 at a time, but it's like 14, that we kind of do the halfway through thing, so you only get to come like halfway up. That's a little bit of a bummer, but we got to expedite things. But there's something so meaningful. This is why communion rails were ever a thing. The communion rail was built out of the same material as the altar. So that's why, so look at this material, same exact material as the altar. There would be a communion rail made out of the same thing that as you come forward to the rail, you're, you're coming, I mean, you can't all come to the altar, it's kind of small, but they would all come to the rail and sometimes they would even take a white cloth at St. Peter's, they still do this, and they drape the white cloth over the rail. You're like at the altar, you're at the altar, you're coming so, so close. You're not just way back there in the church anymore. You're super close. You're in the sanctuary. You're at the threshold of the gates of heaven, so to speak, and you're close to him. Not that you have to be far from him during the mass. Hopefully you're not far from him, but there's this movement closer. In Holy Communion, you are the, hear me, hear me out. When you receive, the moment that you receive Holy Communion, is the closest you'll ever be to Jesus this side of heaven. The moment that you receive Holy Communion, it's the closest that you will be to the beatific vision, to the Holy Trinity, to Jesus himself, the Son of God. It's the closest you'll be to him this side of heaven. That's how important that moment is. When I was a college student, we were at St. Margaret Mary's, and the priest there, Father Paul Hazing, would actually, he asked us to use the communion rail, that when we would come up to receive communion, that we would kneel on the step and receive communion. But it was so beautiful, because he would just say, please linger. Like, kneel there at the rail, receive communion, and stay as long as you want. There's this kind of, when we're in line, it's like, body Christ, amen, body Christ, amen, amen, amen. Go, 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 go. We got fast, 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 fast. There's something about the rail, at least, that was like, oh, I can just kneel here, and I can, like, look up at the crucifix, and I can, like, feel, I can feel the stone. And Margaret Mary's, it's made out of stone. You can just, like, feel the stone, like I'm at the altar, like I'm on the altar, even, that I'm, I'm at the threshold of eternal life. There's something about that ability to just like linger right there that was really, really powerful. You get to come that close. I preached a random daily mass homily a couple weeks ago that I thought was pretty good because <clears throat> this image that the Lord gave me as I was preaching about Holy Communion was this, just like I brought up that bridal imagery before. I re remembered for First Communion, we... Some people are like offended that we dress little kids up in white dresses and suits. I don't know what they get offended about, but um, I think it's beautiful. It's almost, they're almost like little brides or little grooms. Why would we do such a silly thing? Because for the first time in a really powerful way, it's not that second graders are without Jesus until this moment, but they are coming down the aisle like a bride to meet the bridegroom here in the Eucharist. Every one of you, when you get in line, you are walking down the aisle to meet the bridegroom. It's that tender of a moment. Again, think of the moment when the doors, oh, here at Wenceslas, we do it up. We've got the, the doors are closed, and I say, please stand. And if Rick Jacoby's doing it, he does this thing on the trumpets on the organ. It's like, do, 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 do. or if it's on the piano, he goes, do, 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 do. it's so, and then the doors open at the same time and the way that it is here at Wenceslas the glass doors are behind the bride so you, she's just bathed in light from behind it's like a it's like the beatific vision and she steps into the church and everyone sobs and it's like oh the bride the bride's coming to meet the bridegroom and there's this stunning moment that the bridegroom just gazes at the bride cannot wait for her to be in the sanctuary with him that's holy communion. It's not just a casual assembly line. It's not just lining up at the DMV. It is, you're lining up as the bride. You're lining up to walk down the aisle. I got to walk down the aisle twice 
when I was ordained, my diaconate ordination, my priesthood ordination, I like couldn't breathe. I mean, I was so, I'll never forget that moment. I'm like, I am walking up this aisle as just Taylor, but I'm going to walk down this aisle as Father Taylor. Like this is going to completely change my life. That can happen every time you walk up the aisle to receive Jesus, the bridegroom. Uh, a couple months ago, <clears throat> a man came up to me after Mass, just another random thought about communion, and he chided me for uh, sitting down too soon. He said, tell me more. I preached to homily about this. You might have heard it. He said, tell me more. He said, F well, he said, the deacon's got, you know, the, 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 the thing. I'm like, the ciborium? Yeah, ciborium. I think he called it a chalice. I'm like, mm-mm. Deacon's got the ciborium, and he's going to the tabernacle, and you, you're, you sit. I'm like, and? He said, well, you're, well, I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, you're supposed to be standing, because the, the ciborium is, is not in the tabernacle yet. You're supposed to be standing and facing the tabernacle. That's what Father Tim does, or that's what Father so-and-so does. I'm like, well, that's not what Father Taylor does. Right? <laughs> said, Why is that? I would even argue that it's more important that you get to fully experience being a living tabernacle for a few minutes than worrying about this tabernacle up here. Now, that sounds a little sacrilegious because the whole time when you come into church, there's the tabernacle, I'm going to genuflect. Okay, where's, Jesus? where's the tabernacle? Okay, there's the tabernacle, I'm going to genuflect. Great, all my attention goes there. Or to the altar, I bow to the altar during the liturgy. Once you've received communion, you are the tabernacle. And that's not just some weird new age. It's what it's for. The Eucharist isn't for the tabernacle. The Eucharist is for you. And in that moment, you get to become the tabernacle. A living, breathing, walking tabernacle. And you bring it out into the world. But for a few minutes, you get to linger. Even if the music's bad. Even if... You're distracted and your kids are jumping all over the place. You get to become a living tabernacle. So I told this poor man, I said, sir, what's it like for you to receive Holy Communion? You're so worried about whether or not that tabernacle door is closed. Don't worry, here at Wenceslas, you can hear it. You can hear when it closes. So you don't have to stand and look at it. So I'm, as soon as I'm done receiving Communion, I want to go back to my seat and just linger for a second in communion with Jesus. Frankly, I'm not too concerned about those hosts over there. I mean, I know it's Jesus. I know it's the Eucharist. I know that's the tabernacle. I know that I just genuflected to Jesus. But guess where Jesus is right now? He's right here. So I would encourage all of you. I don't know if you feel weird about this. I hope you don't. That once you've received communion, quit worrying about whatever. Is Father done? Wrap it up. What time is it? Are they done communion with over there? Are we, did, is the tabernacle closed? How many? Are, is Father still doing the dishes? <laughs> like, you get like three minutes with this Eucharistic presence of Jesus right here. Savor it. Linger a little. Pause a little. Experience what it's like to be so close to him. Speaking of, well, I'll get there in a second. So I told that man who's boss, just, just so you. And he's like, oh, I never thought about that, Father. Sorry, I, I wasn't trying to win an argument, but I was just like, oh, sir. Like, you don't have to, don't, don't waste that moment. Speaking of wasting moments, I know what it's like. been in the pews for 27 years. When you're in the communion line or you've already received communion and you're back in the pew, I'm like, I know I just received communion, but I really want to see who's here today, right? <laughs> I'm looking, I'm, and maybe I'm just kind of doing the peripheral, like looking out of the corner of my eye. Oh, she, oh, he's home from college. Oh, she's lost weight. Oh, she wore that to church today. I know what you're all thinking. Been there. Judged that. Okay, I've been there. I've absolutely been there. It can be really easy to be like, oh, oh okay, good looking around. There's people. Oh, look, hey, over there. And, and sometimes people come up to me 
at communion and they want to have a converse and I'm like, just receive communion. Like, Father, that homily, Father, I ju- that was the best homily. I'm like, the body of Christ, quit talking to me about my homily. Tell me afterwards. Sorry, rant, over. So here's a thought. I'm not telling you that you got to put blinders on and pretend like no one else is there with you. I actually think it's important that you experience the ecclesial dimension of all receiving communion together. It's not a sin to look at the person coming up the aisle. My encouragement for you is that you wouldn't just look at them or their body parts or what they're wearing or how much weight they've lost or gained or whether or not they're back from college, but that you would pray for them. Ever thought about that before? As you're kneeling there, having just received communion, and you really want to open your eyes and look at the aisle, that you would just, Lord Jesus, would you just bless Mary as she's preparing to receive you? Ooh, Lord Jesus, there's Jeff. He's in college. He might not be super into this. Would you just give him a really powerful experience of your presence today? Ooh, I don't even know that guy, but it looks like he's having a tough day. Jesus, would you just bless him and give him a powerful experience of the eternal life that you have in your body and blood? Whoa. See how we just turned a distraction into a prayer. And you're experiencing this ecclesial dimension of what it is that we're all receiving at the altar. We've already prayed that we would all be one and that we'd be at peace with one another. Now you're literally doing it. You're praying it as you're seeing people come up to receive communion. Also, please don't judge how people receive communion. There's lots of room there. People, some people genuflex, some people bow, some people can't do anything, they just have a cane and they kind of snatch it. Some people receive in the hands, some people receive in the tongue. Please don't be judgy and please don't be mean about people receiving communion. I said, Father, doing the dishes before. People say this, I'm like, oh, Father's doing the dishes. Did you know that that's not only a practical thing for us to do, but it's a deeply symbolic gesture in the Holy Liturgy, the purification of the sacred vessels? Why is that? Well, it's necessary, obviously, to remove the particles of the Eucharist from these precious vessels that we've used, but there is a powerful prayer that I love to pray even outside of Mass that happens as I'm purifying the vessels. Listen to the prayer. What has passed our lips as food, O Lord, may we possess in purity of heart, that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. Whoa. So I'm praying that the purifying that I'm doing right now with the purificator and the chalice and the patent, that that purifying that I'm doing would happen in your heart, my heart and yours right now. That as I'm wiping the chalice clean from inside because of Jesus being in there, that Jesus, now that he's in you, would start to purify your chalice purify your heart. What has passed our lips as food, O Lord, may we possess in purity of heart that what's been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. I love how often the word healing is used throughout the Mass, and I love that it's used right there. It's the, it's the next thing I say after I receive Jesus. I purify the vessels, and I ask that the Eucharist that's now in me would purify me and bring me healing. And I'm not just praying that for me, it's the collective we, what has passed our lips, may we possess in purity of heart. So I hope that when you're watching Father do the dishes, and it's kind of like, okay, wrap it up and whatever, that all the purifying that you're watching happen when you hear the water pour into the chalice, when you hear maybe the shh, shh, shh of cleaning the rim of the chalice, that you would experience this purifying that's happening in your heart right now because you've received him. We pray that prayer after communion, which again, I encourage you to read ahead of time because it's so powerful. And then just like I explained the first time, the, the blessing and the dismissal, it, it's an image of what Jesus did at his ascension. He raised his arms over his apostles and he blessed them. 
And then <clears throat> he sent them in the Great Commission to go and announce the gospel of the Lord. And you're doing that now as a living, walking, breathing tabernacle. And I love, there's those, play, I think um, Saint, or Saint, Christ the King, Christ the King, has those signs in the parking lot as you're leaving the parking lot that says, now entering mission territory. I love that. As you're leaving the parking lot, you Catholics after Mass, you are now entering mission territory. You're entering the mission field as a living tabernacle with Jesus in you. There is so much more I could say about praying the Mass. There's so many pieces of it. But I want to end by giving you this little thing on the vestments to tell you what each one is and what we pray as we're putting it on. This is a vestment you may not have seen much. I'm the only priest at St. Wenceslas that wears it. It's called an amos. It looks like this. You're like, what is that? So an amos has to be used with a square-necked alb. All the other priests have albs that go all the way up to their necks. My, mine is a square neck, and priests would often wear this not even, it wasn't like Vatican II. It was even like before, I mean, before Vatican II, they were already making like zipper albs and Velcro albs. It was pretty much the invention of the zipper and the Velcro, which has been around for a while. But this is something that covers up kind of the top part of my clothing. But you know who wears amices in daily life? Firefighters and soldiers. They wear them under their helmets. So it's kind of a, an image of a helmet. In some religious orders, the monks literally will wear this on their head and almost wear it like a bonnet. They'll wear it kind of like this and they'll tie it under their chins. I wear it just around my neck and it smells like my cologne. And I tuck it into my collar like this. And what I pray is a prayer that has to do with a helmet. How would I come up with a prayer about a helmet? St. Paul talks about putting on the helmet of salvation. Lord, set the helmet of salvation on my head and guard me from all the assaults of the enemy. That's bold. That's the first thing I pray as I'm getting ready for Mass. Not only now, uh, throughout my whole life too, but even in this Mass, that the Lord would put the helmet of salvation on my head and guard me from all the assaults of the enemy, even in this Mass. Next. The alb, which is a sign of my baptism. When I was baptized in May of 1991, the priest, I was probably wearing a white, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> the priest put a white garment on me. And there's a beautiful prayer. Um, Taylor, receive this white garment, a sign of your Christian dignity, and bring it unstained into eternal life. I put on this white garment at every Mass as a sign that I've been baptized. So it's a sign of my baptism, but alb comes from the same word from, as albino. It just means white, the white thing, the alb. And I say, this is a cool prayer, Purify me, Lord, and cleanse my heart that washed in the blood of the Lamb, I may enjoy eternal joys. Imagery there, huh? Purify me, make me white, make me white as snow, like Psalm 51 says, that washed in the blood of the Lamb. We don't wash things in blood, another liturgical oxymoron, but being washed in the blood of the Lamb actually makes us clean. I may enjoy eternal joys. Next, I'm also the only priest at Wenceslas that wears a cincture. Don't know why that's the case, because a cincture is a sign of chastity. So why is that? I mean, it's also practical, because it's like a belt. But it's a sign of chastity. Uh, remember, in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, people were instructed to Gird their loins. Jesus even uses that. He says, gird your loins and light your lamps that you might be ready when the master comes and knocks. So to gird one's loins meant that you were ready. You were ready to run. You were ready to fight. You, were, you gird your loins. You're ready. 
There was also this ancient image that girding one's loins would, and this may be an old wives' tale, so to speak, but there's meaning to it, that it would actually, to help you be chaste, there was this belief that kind of your sexual faculties, and I suppose for women it is kind of like in your abdomen, but if you gird it, if you, if you cincture it, if you tighten it up, if you tie it up, that even your affections, your, your sexual thoughts and feelings and desires would, would sort of be purified and almost tamed. That's why they would gird their loins, because soldiers were required to abstain from intercourse with their spouses. So, I pray this. Lord, tie the cincture of purity around me and quench my earthly desires that the virtues of chastity and continence may ever dwell within me. Tie it nice and tight. Then, the stole. The stole is a sign of authority. Comes from kind of ancient Roman custom judges and magistrates and civil officials and emperors, they would, if they were doing something authoritative, they would wear the stole. The stole was the sign of their authority. So the stole is a sign of my priestly authority. Um, exorcists, when they're performing the rite of exorcism, wear a purple stole. And in the rite of exorcism, they actually use the stole. This happens also in... Uh, rites of marriage, um, I think the old rite of Roman Catholic betrothal, but in rites of marriage in like the Byzantine rite of Catholicism, the priest takes the ends of his authoritative stole and wraps it that while the couple is holding their hands saying their vows, the priest wraps his stole around their hands. And it can be really powerful during an exorcism. Often a priest will be instructed to sort of lay his stole across the person being exorcised, that it's like literally touching the person. I'm not the diocesan exorcist, um, but we have two, and I think one in training, and so often they use their purple stole physically during the rite of exorcism, but I get to wear it every time. I'm supposed to kiss it, don't know why. I suppose I could kiss every vestment, but I say, Lord, restore the stole of immortality which I lost through the actions of my first parents. And although I'm unworthy to approach your sacred mysteries, may I enjoy eternal joys. There's a lot there. Immortality was an authority that we had as creatures before we lost it through original sin. I asked Jesus before every Mass to restore the stole of immortality that I lost through the actions of my first parents. And I admit that I'm unworthy to approach the sacred mysteries, but may I still enjoy eternal joys. Finally, St. Paul says this, over all these, put on, thank you, over all these, so he's peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, da 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 da, da but over all these, put on love. The chasuble is a sign of charity which covers everything else. My charity covers my authority. Charity covers my chastity. Charity covers my purity of heart. Charity covers the, the protection, the, the fighting of the enemy. But I pray this prayer, also very scriptural. Lord, you said... My yoke is easy and my burden light. Grant that I may carry your yoke well so as to receive your grace. Remember, a yoke of oxen, it goes over their shoulders. And this is the vestment that goes over my whole body, over my shoulders, and it covers the rest in charity. It covers everything else. <clears throat> There's some priests that wear their stoles on top of their chasuble, and I'm like, Padre, bad image. Like, I wear my authority over my charity. I'm like, you probably shouldn't do that, <laughs> right? Your authority doesn't trump everything else. Um, charity does, right? Charity, charity is the thing that covers all the other virtues. That's the vestments. 
as you see them, you can pray for some of the, th- the same things yourselves, but this is the meaning of why I'm covered. And in some ways, it's like, so that Taylor can go away and Jesus can emerge. Not all the way, like we don't believe in nirvana. I don't entirely go away. My personality is consecrated in the midst of my Ars Celebrandi, the way that I celebrate the Mass. But you're meant to see Jesus, that I get to stand in the person of Jesus with you and for you as we're experiencing his life, death, and resurrection in the Mass. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Thanks, everybody, for coming. What a blessing. Thank him again. I'll be short. Just wanted to point out that this survey closes tomorrow. So if you haven't done your survey, it doesn't even take 10 minutes. Uh, please give us your vision. Give us your dream. Give us the spirits and inspiration that you have for the future of our church for the next five or seven years with a little survey. There's paper ones out here in the foyer. There's online ones. Um, I just ask if you've taken a paper one, bring it back so we can get your input as well. Thank you guys so much for coming. Watch for these videos on Facebook and the, and the website and have a wonderful day.